gospel today comes from the gospel of St. Matthew, the 24th chapter, beginning with the 36th verse. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the disciples, About that day and that hour, no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. For as the days of Noah were, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them all away. So too will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two will be in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding meal together. One will be taken and one will be left. Keep awake, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But understand this. The owner of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming. He would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready. The Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. You may be seated. Well, grace and peace to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So today, as I, as I was talking with the children today, today is the first Sunday of Advent. This is the beginning of the Advent season, and Advent is a time uh, of preparation. It is a time of waiting. It is a time of, of, of hope, uh, hope and, and waiting for Christ. In fact, that first candle that we lit today is the candle of hope. It's this, this anticipation that we have for the coming of Christ. And so, you may be wondering, What's with the gospel today? In fact, it, it's a little even more different because we have actually been making our way through the gospel of Luke, and today we jump into the gospel of Matthew to get this text. And to some of you, this may be a somewhat familiar text. If you have ever heard anybody talking about the rapture or, or the left behind or all that kind of stuff, uh, some of it is taken from this text. In fact, that, that, that phrase, left behind, is... Uh, in regards to this text where one is working in the field, two people are working in the field and one uh, is taken away and the other one is left behind. Now, I don't really want to get into all of that uh, today. Well, I'm, I'm going to preach on something different, but I do want to take just a second to talk about that idea of the rapture and left behind and some of those texts you may be hearing uh, during Advent and thinking it relates to that. That idea, those, those theologies of rapture and left behind and all that kind of stuff, those are based on, on bad, bad theological understanding of the Bible. Those are a misinformation, a um, um, misreading of the Bible. Uh, it takes a lot of assumptions and, and twisting of intention. In fact, it takes uh, one verse in Daniel and between one sentence and the next sentence, between the period and the beginning of the next sentence, uh, in order to make this left behind and this rapture uh, theory to work, you have to insert a thousand years, which aren't said anywhere, they aren't talked about anywhere, but in order to make it work with the convoluted uh, rationale to try to have this all work, that's at it. It's not biblically based. And it's not what God is doing in this world. So, what is this text about? What is God trying to tell his disciples here? What is Jesus talking about? He's talking about preparing for God. And it starts with, for, the, for starters, none of us is going to know when it happens. Jesus says even he himself has no idea when God will come into our life. So how do we prepare for that? Well, I want to tell you a story. Uh, it's a story that I have shared uh, before, so some of you might find it familiar, but uh, it's going to, I think, tie in and help us understand this a little bit more, and I'm going to end it with a confession that I hope will kind of uh, um, explain this a bit more as well. So this is a story about a time that I went to go get a tattoo. Now, when I was a freshman in college, I decided I wanted to get a second tattoo. I already had one. I'd gotten a tattoo when I was a senior in high school. I'd gotten uh, the music to this little light of mine tattooed around my right ankle. And, well, I hate when things are uneven, so I needed to balance out and get one on the other ankle as well. Otherwise, it was just going to drive me crazy. So, I decided I was going to get the music to What a Wonderful World tattooed on my left ankle. 
And so I did my research. I'm, I'm freshman in college. I'm, I'm there at Concordia at Moorhead, and I'm looking around, and I, I, I research all the different tattoo parlors, and I fall on this one place in Moorhead called the Dragon Slayer, which sounds like a great name for a tattoo parlor, right? Had good reviews. Everything was working. Actually, I don't even think it's there anymore. It's been long enough since I've been in college. But this was a great place. And so I, I got a friend to give me a ride, and I went there and I, to, to kind of check it out, uh, talk to the artist, and you know, maybe put down an appointment and all that kind of stuff. And I walk in, and as I walk into the store, the bell rings in the back, you know, to kind of signify that someone walked in, and I hear this voice holler from the back, uh, I'll be up in a minute, just kind of take a look around. So I do. I'm looking around, I'm looking at all the different art on the, on the wall, and, and kind of admiring the, the artistic ability of the artist here. And suddenly, the room gets a little bit dark. And I turn around and I realize the reason the room got a little bit dark is because the voice that had yelled from the back now is standing in the doorway. And this man is so large that he is blocking out a bit of the light. And this man is one of the scariest looking guys I've ever seen in my life. Like the epitome of the guy you don't want to meet in a dark alley by yourself. And he was like six foot six. And he had a sleeveless shirt on, and he had tattoos all the way down, um, tattoos up and down his arms, even on down to his knuckles. And he had a shaved head, and he had a beard that made me think that he was probably a fan of ZZ Top. I mean, it was like down to like here, you know? So just this big, huge, scary, intimidating guy. And I will admit, I was a little taken aback. I was a little unsure, but, he seemed nice enough, and he was the artist there. He was the owner and the artist, and so he was talking a bit, and so I decided, you know what, I'm gonna make an appointment. I'm gonna do this. So uh, that was another sign that this was a, a good place, is that they wouldn't let you just walk in and get a tattoo. You had to make an appointment for a couple weeks in advance, I think, to kind of give you time to make sure if you really wanted to make this decision for the rest of your life, and I did, um, which I'm still happy with, so we're good there. But, so I made an appointment for six weeks uh, in the future, right? And I put half of the money down. And then I, I went at home, and about six weeks later, as the time was coming up for, for me to go and get this tattoo, I'm preparing to go, and my aunt asks if she can come with. Uh, now, my aunt actually lived in Fargo. It was great. She is a retired pastor as, uh, as well. She, uh, at the time, she was serving as the chaplain at the hospital there in Fargo, the big hospital in Fargo. Wonderful woman. Uh, also, as you can probably imagine, being that it comes from my side of the tree, tiny little woman. Um, and, but she also just had this great courage and, and energy, and the, the going and seeing a tattoo is totally up her alley. She had never seen one. She wanted to see it happen, so she asked if she could come with. And I said, yeah, sure, because I, I could always use some, some companionship. Plus, I didn't have a car. She'd give me a ride. So she drives me there. We walk in, and the big scary guy is there because, well, not only is he the owner, he's the one who does the tattoo. So we walk in the back, and I'm still kind of intimidated and scared by this guy. And I start to get the tattoo. Now, I don't know if any of you have a out there have a tattoo, but it is a really boring process. You have to sit perfectly still, and it takes a while. And so here we are. We're sitting on the chair, and it's, this one took like an hour, hour and 15 minutes. And I'm sitting still and, and just kind of bored out of my mind. My aunt, on the other hand, start right away, breaks, uh, starts up a conversation with this man. And they start talking about everything. And then he asks what she does for a living, and she says, well, I am a pastor. And he gets all excited, I mean, he stops doing the tattoo, and gets all excited, and goes, oh, that is so great. I have been thinking about trying to contact the pastor. I have two little kids, and I really, really want to get them baptized. And just out of the blue, and he's all excited. And he goes, well, do you do baptisms? My, my aunt says, yes, I'd, I'd love to do a baptism. He goes, oh, that's great. How much do you charge for those? She says, well, I, I don't charge for baptisms. Those, those are a free gift of grace. And they're oh, man. So then they end up, they go and have this huge, long, incredible conversation about faith. And this man has this strong, strong faith, and he wants to talk about it. And he, never, he says, I never get a chance to talk about this. And he wants to talk about it. So they have this wonderful time talking, and I'm left sitting there, again, just flabbergasted, not expecting that at all. We get done with the tattoo, and I go out to the front, and like I said, I pit, put half my money down, so I'm going to pay the rest. He's behind the counter, and I, I slide the, the rest of my money across, and he picks up my cash, and he looks at it for a second, and he hands it back, and he goes, you know what? We're good. Now, I don't know where the church stands on trading tattoos for baptisms. <laughs> Probably not ethical, but what I do know 
And this is my confession. I was left behind in that moment. See, I let my own biases and prejudices about where God is going to come and when God is going to come and, and what form and who God comes through, I let my own biases form my opinion. And because of that, I missed it. I missed God in the world because I was so sure that I knew where God was coming from. My aunt, on the other hand, was prepared. She was awake and ready. She was ready for that bridegroom to come at any time. She was ready for Christ to appear. And because of that, she had this incredible conversation and this incredible moment of faith. While if you really want to get the, the definition of left behind, that was me. I was left behind, left trying to scramble and catch up to God in the world. And the truth is, we do this all the time. We have this idea about this is where God is going to come from. This is what God looks like. This is the time and the place when all this is going to work out. And, and we sometimes even do that unconsciously. We don't think about it. We don't name our biases and prejudices, but they're there. And we start to think that this isn't where God comes on. And because of that, we miss God. We're left behind. We don't see God when God comes as a big, scary tattoo artist or an immigrant. Or since we are in the season of Advent, a pregnant, unwed teenager. God comes in the unexpected places. Mary is not how anyone expected God to come, and yet that's how God chose to come into the world. That's what we're celebrating on Christmas Eve. So if I can ask one thing of you this, this, this Christmas season, and hopefully beyond, it's to take a moment and, and investigate yourself, question yourself. Ask the question of, all right, where is the last place I would expect God? What is the group of people where I don't see as being worthy of carrying the message of God? Who, are, who is the person who I don't like so much that I can never see God's grace in their eye? What is the place where I would let least likely expect to see God? Because we don't actually think about it. We don't name it. I didn't name ahead of time, oh, this scary tattoo artist is a guy I'm not going to expect to see God from. But that message was still floating in my head. And so when I saw him, I pulled back. And all of us have those places of blind bias. Those places where we don't expect to see God. And I'm telling you, that is the place where God is going to come. Because what God asks of us is not to prepare for the end time. Not to prepare for some far off ending time that we don't know when is coming, but to prepare for the very real truth that God comes into our life all the time in all sorts of ways. And, and if we want to not be left behind in the conversation of God's faith, in the conversation of God at work in this world, then we need to be awake. We need to be aware. We need to seek out God in those unexpected places. We need to be prepared to be surprised. To seek God in incredible places. That is what the season of Advent is about. That's what I'm hoping that, that you can learn from today and carry with you. Carry with you. All through the Christmas season. Amen.